Hello friends, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. Hello and welcome everybody and thank you again for joining us in live broadcast. It's always a great honor and pleasure to be here with you and to be able to share time and space and also to go into the ancient scriptures as we so often do. Uh, this evening I'm joined by Noel Hadley and we're going to be looking into the Apocalypse of Abraham for, and if you're not familiar with the text, I, I think it's a very significant and it's one that people should familiarize themselves with. It does go through like a parallel of the Genesis account. Um, and it leads us also into the prophecies of the end times and it gives us, you know, uh, a span of that duration and so uh, and intriguingly it covers a lot of the esoteric subjects that I like to speak about in my books and verifies these premises as well and so looking forward to doing this study. Noel are you there? Shalom from under the domes in. All right brother how are you and um, why don't you also announce that you have uh, recently published and finished and released your latest book and that, you know, this is one that uh, a lot of people ask us uh, if there's anything in the catalog that covers Mud Flood. And um, this is one of the topics that you did uh, write about in this recent release. And so if you would, um, let's talk about it. Well, I've actually released uh, two books uh, rather recently and I knew coming on to your show again because last time I was here I think it was in February you gave me a homework assignment to actually write a book on this topic and <laughs> uh, I was talking of course not just about the mud flood but the millennial kingdom and I knew that I couldn't show my face around here without a product so uh, I think we just <laughs> got it we got it I don't know if it's live yet on sacred word but it's probably like any day now if it's not I, I didn't check today uh, but anyways, it's uh, it's not just the mud flood. It is it's well, it's literally in the title title Millennial Kingdom plus mud flood. And of course, you know, anyone uh, can refer to that uh, interview that Zen and I did about three months, three or four months ago. I don't remember how long it was now. Yeah, it was a great show. Of course, then, yeah, there's the other one that um, I'm really happy with the uh, it continues my uh unexpected cosmology series of the psyops through the decades and it's called exile to aftermath and it it uh it covers the 1940s uh, for those of you who remember last summer when i was on talking to zen about this it was uh the the hidden hand of camelot was the 1960s so mm -hmm. this one is the 40s and it, it covers some really heavy topics like the atomic bomb the holocaust uh it goes to the the black dahlia if anyone knows who that is and uh, just covers all these like Intel uh, projects of the forties. So it's a really interesting read. Well, what is the black Dahlia? The, the black Dahlia is, it was almost like, you know, everyone knows what the Manson murders are. Well, the black Dahlia was yeah. one of the, probably the most popular murders of the 1940s in which uh, a woman was sawed in half and she oh was found, gosh. she was found dumped in a field uh, in Los Angeles, post World War II Los Angeles. And I'm saying it's a hoax. Uh, the Black Dahlia has been made into to movies and all sorts of stuff. I believe it was a, into hoax. I believe the woman who perpetrated it was uh, uh, Egyptian royalty, uh, very likely. And I just go through that. I've, to, as far as I'm concerned, from what I've seen. Um, there are many. There are others who have done more research on the Manson hoax and stuff like that than I have. But I have done more research than anybody else that I have seen on this, and I cover a lot of ground and just take people through the photos and everything and just show how it's it's fake. It wasn't real. So, why do you think um, the? Well, we know you know hoaxes are still ongoing, and that there's been a lot of. Uh, this kind of false flag event happened that, you know, uh, that there's been 
actually paid actors involved in some of this stuff. But why do you think that they're hoaxing uh, so much to, just to keep people dazed and confused and on their toes, yeah. driving agendas? Yeah, a couple reasons. And so what I what I when we talk about like satanic uh, ceremonies, like actual ritual killings, I, I, I think that those are very real, you know, happen in the Vatican and, you know, Buckingham Palace, all those places. But they're behind the scenes. and They don't advertise them. And I think that those are very regular. What we get in the news is all fake. And it's uh, it's something uh, I like to call psychodrama. And this is also performance witchcraft. It's what it's real magic. It's not real, but it's real magic. Now, this goes all the way back to Babylon. And what they started doing in the mystery religions and the, the Babylonian mysteries is they they uh, acting actually came out of it. And what the actor would do is he would act as the shaman, the spiritual shaman that would open up the, the veil to the, the gods. And he would it was all in the performance. And as you sit in the audience, you you grant permission to be lied to because, you know, the actor is lying to you. He's not actually, you know, feeling these things and doing these things. Right. But he he's going to make you laugh and cry and get angry and all these different emotions. And that's how they start to mold uh, you to the B system. And it's it's real magic. And so it's it's everywhere around us. So uh, psychodrama is. Is really important with the MK Ultra program, uh, but it's you know the MK Ultra program on a on a worldwide stage. If the world is a stage, and all these things they're doing the news, every, everything from uh, you know COVID to everything, it's 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 performance witchcraft. It's all acting in order to get you you, you sign off on it as something legit, and it allows you to uh, create fear and anger and all these different emotions, and and it you just seep deeper into the system. Uh, this is how they get our hold on us. And I believe this has been going on, you know, like I said, back to Babylon since the very beginning. So, um, yeah. You know, what it reminds me of is um, the skits and the plays and the things that they do during the summer solstice and Bohemian Grove, you know, where they do like the cremation of care. Yes. And absolutely. all that. Yeah. Yeah, and that, yeah. Well, you know, you look at, uh, April is is a huge event for. Um, you know, we just had the uh, the New York City subway shooting. I believe that was a hoax. I don't believe anyone died. It was a drill. But they do this. They love April. April is a big month for these uh, these operations that they pump out these uh, ritual killing ceremonies. And there's ceremonies and and again, it's it's selling people on on an illusion. And th that's that's what's so important with performance witchcraft. That's what it's performance. It has to be fake. It has to be. Um, that's that's where it, you know the, the magic kicks in. So, yeah. well, I, I definitely you know um, like the the one school shooting that was um, found to be in how they had you know the principal ended up being part of another. You mean shooting Sandy Hook? later? Yeah, yeah, Sandy Hook. Yeah, and, yeah, the, yeah. In Boston bombing and all that. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, a lot that, of the same players were at both. Right, exactly. And then I, I remember that uh, because Alex Jones came out, you know, talking about this and and how it had been hoaxed that he took a lot of heat for that. And that even a lot of people that are part of the community as far as, you know, those that have awakened and understand that there are real conspiracy things going on out there. But still, they they put so much pressure on him just because, and it is, you know, like when you look into it, um, people that were said to have been killed and murdered and uh, lost their lives and were ended up being part of a whole nother scenario later. Uh, and then you had mentioned the uh, the bombing there in Boston with the marathon. And, you know, that guy that supposedly had his legs blown off and right. now, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, yeah would, I, I saw and looked into you a could lot actually, of that. Yeah, you can actually, I have a paper on that and you could actually see the wires hanging out of its his leg. It's so bad. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, it just, it's really bad. But it, you know, this is a, a good lesson for everyone listening that uh, where Alex Jones got in trouble and also a guy named uh, Jim Fetzer who, uh, 
did a lot of right. writing on this and he was published through Infowars. He's not associated with Infowars, but he was kind of a third party uh, published through them and he got sued. And I don't know uh, what the settlement was, but where he got in trouble was saying that nobody died at Sandy Hook and they were, he was demanding to see the, uh, the birth certificates. I mean, sorry, the death certificates. Well, this is what everybody needs to realize is that a, a death certificate is a birth. And, uh, when you have a child and you give them a birth certificate, that is not for the flesh and blood self. Okay. That is, that is, you create an entity apart from your child and you can, you can, anybody can have a death certificate, a death certificate. Now, I mean, if I die, I'm sure I'll get a death certificate because I do have a birth certificate, but Theoretically, you could kill off my death certificate and assign me a new entity. Um, and that's what everybody needs to realize with this, that just because there is a death certificate does not indicate whether a flesh and blood person exists or doesn't exist. But that's where they got in trouble. And a lot of conspiracy theorists and truthers don't realize that, uh, that, you know, the, the importance of understanding that the, um, you know, that the, you, you have a corporate self, you know, all capital letters and so on and so forth. But that's where they got in trouble on that. Yeah, Jim Fetzer, he's actually here on Revolution Radio as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. A, I really like his work. He's uh, he's done some great stuff. Yeah, he really has, uh, especially you know looking into all of the events with 9/11 and going on from there. Um, he's been really uh, you know ahead of the game on a lot of this stuff. But yeah, they you know I, I think part of what they do as well as with the hoaxing is to make people that are conspiracy theorists look foolish in the eyes of the mainstream and in the eyes of the, you know, the lay people that really don't know different and better that there are hoaxes going on as well as false flag events as well. Um, and, and so there's a mix of both. And when you deny or support either or, you know, they attack you accordingly. And and then if you actually go to the point where you deny a, an event happening or, you know, nobody died or said, then they really grill you and uh, try to make you look crazy. And well, it's okay, almost so about attacking the messenger, you know. Well, yeah, and you know that they uh, gaslighting is a classic intel technique. They will gaslight all of us. Uh, I'm not too concerned about that. I'm not too concerned about how I'm I'm viewed. Now, keep in mind that uh, I'll go ahead and say this: that one of the things in uh, Exile to Aftermath, the title actually refers to kind of the atomic bomb and and how it led to Zionism. That the aftermath of the bomb was, you know, this exile to Zionism. But the I, I I sometimes wonder how I'm going to be uh, portrayed once once I die, um, it's, especially if I get to, to be known for this, because in the book I talk about the Holocaust. And um, if I could explain this in a nutshell, this is a really, really difficult to topic to uh, talk about with people because people really get emotionally rung up with this. And, you know, all those poor people that went into those showers and they never made it out. Um, if I could, I do, I do like 70 pages just talking about Auschwitz, the big A. And, um, I won't go into too much detail on this, but I would ask everyone to think about this, that if I were going to gas a people group and I were going to eliminate, you know, just say the Irish, okay, I'm going to eliminate the Irish people and I'm going to coax them all. I'm going to create some system to coax them all into a shower where I'm going to off them. I would not build a shower house. I mean, well, I would not build a gas chamber with a wood door uh, with a glass window on it. You would figure that at some point in that time that somebody would go, wait a second, I'm dying. And they would punch their, their fists through that glass to save everybody. But it never happened once. That's just in a nutshell. I would ask people to think about that, try to make common sense of that. And from there, it's just... It goes on and on and on and on, and it becomes even more ridiculous as you start to realize how the you know how you're you're at a magic show and you're watching a magician pull a rabbit from a hat or a pigeon from the sleeve, and you're like, I see what you did there. So, do you not believe anybody was killed during all that time, oh, yeah. or 
Oh yeah, I mean it was World War II, right? A lot yeah, of people died. Yeah. War, war is war is hell. So a, a great here's a well since we're talking about it, I'll go ahead and say this. When I was in the eleventh grade uh, modern world history, I distinctly recall when we they you know shut off the lights. You know, they brought the TV up, the flickering screen, shut off the lights, put on the Holocaust film. And the famous imagery that they show is Bergen Bilson. Bergen Bilson was the one that they invited the media in to witness it. And it's the famous footage of like the guy driving the bulldozer, smoking a cigarette as he's bulldozing bodies into a ditch. And you're seeing like these two Nazi soldiers, you know, uh, you know, piling these bodies in. And, and you're just like, you know, you're like, excuse my language, but you're just saying they're going, you know, those bastard, you know, those Nazi bastards, they actually did it. They killed all those people. Well, you, you, you have to realize how, how deceptive these films are and how they're lying to you. What they don't tell you is that Bergen Bilson and, and Nordhausen, uh, they invited the media in after the allies, uh, the British and the Americans, bombed Bergen Bilson to hell. I mean, they, they you can go look at the original Life magazine photos, and there are Germans sprayed everywhere, like women, children, all along the roads dead, uh, you know, feet dangling out of, you know, it's just, it was awful. And you start looking at this. And you're like, wait a second. How is it that that Bergen Bilson? This is Bergen Bilson is where um, Anne Frank died, by the way, of uh, of typhoid. And um, and you you you're like, well, I didn't I didn't realize they uh, they they killed the Jews in their pajamas, and they're all laid out. And then you're like, wait a second. Why is Bergen Bilson burnt down? And you're like, oh, I I get it. The Americans went and blew it up. And what they did was they brought in the propaganda cameras and they said, look what the, it, the equivalent would be like if, um, if I were to take somebody and hold their head underwater and eventually they're going to drown. And so they're going to start, you know, swinging their, their fists up at me. And I'm like, Hey, look, everybody, look at this person. He's showing no fruit. Look what he's doing right now. He's being such a bully. And everyone's like, yeah, look at that guy. He's trying to hit you. And that's basically what they did. They went and destroyed Nazi Germany, just burnt it down to a uh, crisp and, and killed everybody there and pointed the finger at them. And, um, and so I, I take people through that whole process and show. And, and you know what happens when uh, you have these diseases, when the allies, they blow up all the hospitals, they blow up all the factories. Uh, they blow up all the train routes. They can't get medicine to the troops. All these camps had hospitals. They were trying to save them. They had dentists. They had brothels. They had libraries. They had schools. They had swimming pools. You know, they were like they were taking care of these people. And what happened was is they didn't get the medicine. They didn't get the food. They started getting thinner. They started dying off, you know, and it just goes goes on from there. It was a terrible war. It was awful. Um, and, uh, anyways, I take people through that process. It's a very emotional journey for a lot of people because we've really been sold, uh, into this idea that this very specific people group was targeted. Um, and that just isn't the case. That just, that couldn't be any further from the truth. Um, yeah, they did go to prison camps. A lot of people went to prison camps in America too. You know, we were throwing Japanese and imagine if America lost the war and, you know, Japan turned it around on us. Right. So anyways. Hmm. Plenty, plenty to chew on in this book. I also show how the atomic bomb was a hoax. Um, now, I, I, you know, if people ask me, well, what do they have now? I don't know. I don't know what they have now. But I'm telling you that the atomic bomb over uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they were a hoax. You, if you look at photos of, of Japan, we, we bombed, uh, we annihilated incinerated over a hundred Japanese cities, maybe a, a upwards of 200. I'm not quite sure. Well over a hundred. Um, that doesn't include what we did in, in Europe and the way we, and so you can look at photos of, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki with other photos and Google can't even tell them apart. They'll give you other cities and claim it's Hiroshima because they can't tell. They all look the same. And what they were actually doing is something, uh, called firebombing where they would take thousands of these, uh, these bombs, these little tiny bombs, and they would just detonate them very close, uh, together. And it would create these, um, these like, uh, like a, like these wind, these high gust winds of just pure molten heat that would just melt skin. And they were awful. They were awful. You know, all these people, women and children. But the, the big hustle is the atomic bomb. Now, keep in mind, you know, with enough TNT, you can create a, a mushroom cloud. I've seen a mushroom cloud. Um, it's very easy to do. But 
I, you know, I go into that and I just show photos and the evidence. And my hope is that I could, you know, people will, will be open minded and look at this and go, yeah, I think you're onto something, Noel. Um, you know, and it's it, it's it's the hardest part is getting people past the emotion of, you know, of all the indoctrination that we've been fed and, and so on and so forth. So uh-huh. um, let me you said that the people in these different camps that they were being taken care of like with brothels and oh yeah libraries Aush- and all that yes Auschwitz well, what do you was... mean do you mean like the the nazis or like the people that were in prison there oh yeah no auschwitz was they had i, I take people i show the photos uh, they had they had dental work they had hospitals why would you why would you go in and, and treat someone and, and give them new teeth if you're going to gas them on, you know, after breakfast the next day? They had libraries. They had, uh, yeah, they had brothels where prisoners on good behavior can go, you know, get a woman. They had, they had a swimming pool uh, in Auschwitz, and it's it's unbelievable. They had a, a, a bakery and you know, tons of uh, of chimneys. They weren't they weren't gas chambers, uh, and and you actually it's it, it's it's really okay. So this is what happened. Um, uh, when World War II came to an end, everybody knows this. Uh, Russia came up from the east. We came up from the west with the British, uh, the Allies, the French, and you know we had the Berlin Wall. You know, West Germany, West uh, Berlin, and East Berlin. And what happened was, is that the the Russians had the biggest propaganda, the Soviets, um, and. I always remind people of that now, you know, with, with the whole Ukraine situation, all of a sudden the Soviets are the good guys. Um, I, I'm not saying the America's good guys because they're not, but th- they have their they have their fair share of propaganda, too. They were the ones to really push the death camps from their end. And so uh, because because of the Soviet Union and it was um, all closed off to about 1992 ish, 1990, 1992, when uh, it started opening up the tourists again, nobody was able to go into Auschwitz in these places. Now, keep in mind, every single camp um, on the American side in Germany, in West Germany, just so happened to be a concentration camp. The only death camps just so happened to be the ones that were on the Soviet side. And then once we, so you had a good 50 years in there to really impound that propaganda and that indoctrination. Nation. Finally, when the tourists were able to go into Auschwitz in the early 90s, they're like, wait a second. Uh, I think you, uh, the, the, interestingly enough, uh, the Russians had destroyed all evidence in Auschwitz II. Um, it doesn't exist anymore. And in Auschwitz I, they reconstructed the, the so called gas chamber. It was a shower, but they, or I'm sorry, that one was a crematorium um, that they claimed that they, they tricked everyone into being a shower. Um, but they they reconstructed the whole thing, including the chimney and everything. They took the chimney from Auschwitz too. That's how. That's I mean, I, and I show it. That's how. That's how they they tricked and fooled everybody. Um, so it, it just it's very it's again it's very ironic. It's just very strange that the death camps just so happen to be on the Russian side. Um, but yeah, so they the the numbers of of. Of Jews that died as a result of the war was it's so low it's it's nowhere nowhere even on the scale of what they're talking about I couldn't even begin to tell you but it's it's right there um, with all the other prisoners uh, if you were a prisoner in that war there was a chance you might die I mean you you had a good chance of dying in the prisons you had a good chance of dying on the field of battle there's a lot of people that died everywhere it was just a terrible time but the point was is that there is there is no um, paperwork ever produced ever that shows that there was some sort of master plan uh, signed off by Hitler or any member of the Third Reich to dis- to uh, completely eliminate this people group. In fact, we know that they were actually helping them settle in Israel uh, early on in the war. Um, and so and that's a whole I don't get into that in this book uh, because I mainly just deal with Auschwitz and Bergen Bilsen. Uh, but uh, there's, you know, for, you know, for the Nazis being so. Uh, loving their paperwork you know you never go you never watch a nazi film without somebody saying you know show me your papers there's no paperwork that's the funny part i shouldn't say it's funny this is a t- you know a very serious topic but uh, there's just nothing was ever produced ever so do you don't think that there was any kind of like organized effort to um bus or train jews into any kind of camp and to target them with any kind of elimination and and then as far as how many people died do you think it was like what 
thousands, not millions, or what? yeah, not in the not in the millions uh, in terms of Jews in the camps. Uh, total people who died in the camps, I don't know. I uh, keep in mind there was way more that you know we have this idea they're just throwing Jews. They were throwing all sorts of people into those camps. I don't know, but six million is the magic number that they're, that that was put forward. Uh, probably 50 years before World War II, you start seeing that emerge in newspapers that there's the 6 million number. Um, and, you know, that I think, I can't remember how many uh, originally died at Aus uh, Auschwitz, according to the Russians. It was close to the 6 million. And now they're down to like, maybe, I don't know what the number is now, 2 million, they say officially. But yeah, it's, it's in the thousands. But again, I, I can't, I couldn't even begin to speculate on that. All I know is, is that the, there were there was no um, however many people died there. It, it was not because they were um, trying to eliminate a people group. They were not rounding people up to eliminate a people group. They were throwing people in prison. Yes. And there, there was a lot of reasons to go into that. And all the different people who were declaring war with Germany that were being rounded up. Um, so. It's like the same thing I, you know, I said how that, you know, the Japanese were being rounded up as well uh, in uh, camps in World War II as well. So, yeah, I, I know that happened. Yeah. All right. We'll be right back, everyone, for the second portion. As a bookstore for truth seekers, it's our goal to make ancient manuscripts which were once held captive by secretive institutions available for public consideration. In our generation where wisdom has increased as Daniel the prophet foretold, we have access to many of the testimonies our early church brethren were persecuted for preserving. After being hidden for centuries, these manuscripts have been leaked from various sources throughout the earth and it's our goal to gather these sources into printable form to make available for all who seek the ancient way. If you're looking to deepen your studies of the biblical narrative, find these ancient manuscripts and more at sacredwordpublishing.com. This book is one of those that comes from the, uh, the discourse of the anti-Nicene church fathers. And it was over, um, of course, what to include within the canon and what to authorize as the books that the church um, okay for public dissemination. And it was of course excluded. And yet like the book of Acts, it covers much information uh, between what was a represent, representative of Satan, uh, Simon the Magus, and Peter as he went through his travels all throughout the land. And they kept coming and butting heads with one another and Simon kept um, leading astray the people. And he had really actually a lot of good questions um, that helped in the dialogue of the text and the information that is brought forth within this book can help people to understand not only the, um, the times and what the apostles were going through, but also it speaks about the fallen angels in great detail, uh, the origins of evil, um, even the giants and how they came to be within the world, which is part of that whole theme of Genesis 6, the sons of God mating with the daughters of man, creating a race of giants, how they were here before and after the flood, which is um, one of those esoteric subjects that many of us have now begun to investigate in great detail. And so this, like the book of Enoch, speaks about that and covers it and shares the information about how these fallen angels are not gods, even though they are and have been celebrated by cultures and civilizations uh, as holding this co-omnipotence with the Most High. But they are created angelic beings 
and being cast out, they have always now become what we refer to as legion and what Paul refers to as the powers, the principalities, the rulers of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. And so there's great clarity brought out within the discourses of this book. It also speaks about and confirms that the devil is the father of the bad seed, uh, serpent seed, the feminine Holy Spirit and how she is part of the pre-existent triune Godhead, which the Israelites worship and which most people still don't understand. Um, all of those things are brought forth in this manuscript as well. And so it will help to give you perspective on um, much that most people have never read about. All right, welcome back everybody for a second portion. And as I said earlier, we are going to be covering the apocalypse of Abraham, which is, um, I think, one of my most favorite texts. There are two translations. We're going to read from the longer translations. And the translators are actually anonymous and unknown. Uh, but whoever did bring them into the English, I appreciate you, whoever you may be. Um, you ready, Noel? I am ready. Thank you for having me on, and sorry for the distraction for the first thirty minutes. But uh, I oh, will no, be reading. All good. All good, really. I'm I'm reading from the Great Commission three uh, tonight. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's what I'm reading from as well. And um, like I said, we're gonna be reading from the first translation because it has um, more parts to it, and then we will you know, do comparison when we get to the other as well. But we'll just um, go chapter by chapter. And whenever you have commentary or you're going to bring something up, feel free to stop me and we'll alternate chapters. So I'll begin with chapter one and you can pick up with chapter two. Excellent. Sound good? All right. That's good. All right. Chapter one. On the day I was guarding the gods of my father, Terra, and the gods of my brother, Nahor, while I was testing to find out which God is in truth the strongest, I then, Abraham, at the time when my lot came, when I was completing the services of my father, Terah's sacrifice to his gods of wood, of stone, of gold, of silver, of copper, and of iron, having entered their temple for the service, I found a god named Maramath carved from stone fallen at the feet of the iron god Nakim. And it came to pass that when I saw it, my heart was perplexed. And I thought in my mind that I, Abraham, could not put it back in its place alone because it was heavy, being made of a big stone. But I went and told my father, and he came in with me, and we both lifted it to put it in its place. Its head fell off even while I was holding it by its head. And it came to pass when my father saw that the head of his god, Maramath, had fallen. He said to me, Abraham. And I said, Here I am. And he said to me, Bring me the axes and chisels from the house. And I brought them to him from the house. And he cut another Maramath from another stone without a head. And he smashed the head that had fallen off Maramath and the rest of Maramath. Chapter 2. He made five other gods, and he gave them to me and ordered me to sell them outside on the town road. I saddled my father's ass and loaded them on it and went out on the highway to sell them. And behold, merchants from Fandana of Syria were coming with camels on their way to Egypt to buy coconut from the Nile. I asked them a question, and they answered me. And walking along, I conversed with them. One of their camels screamed. The ass took fright and ran away and threw off the god. Three of them were crushed, and two remained intact. And it came to pass that when the Syrians saw that I had gods, they said to me, 
why did you not tell us that you had gods? We would have bought them before the ass heard the camel's voice, and you have no uh, and you had no loss. Give us at least the god that remains, or the gods that remain, and we will give you a suitable price. I considered in my heart, and they paid both for the smashed god and the. Uh, I'm going to say Elohim, smashed Elohim and the Elohim which remained. For I had been grieving in my heart how I would be, uh, bring payment to my father. I threw three broken Elohim into the water of the river Gur, which was in this place. And they sank into the depths of the river Gur and were no more. Chapter 3. As I was still walking on the road, my heart was disturbed and my mind distracted. I said in my heart, what is the inequality of activity which my father is doing? Is it not he rather who is God? for his gods, because they come into being from his sculpting, his planning, and his skill. They ought to honor my father because they are his work. What is this food of my father and his works? Behold, Maramoth fell and could not stand up in his sanctuary, nor could I myself lift him until my father came, and we raised him up. And even so, we were not able to do it. And his head fell off of him, and he put it on another stone of another god, which he had made without a head. And the other five gods, which God smashed in falling from the ass, who could not save themselves and injure the ass because it smashed them? Nor did their shards come up out of the river. And I said to my heart, If it is so, how then can my father's god, Maramath, which has the head of another stone, and which is made from another stone, save a man, or heart a man's, or hear a man's prayer, or give him any gift? Chapter 4. And thinking thus, I came to my father's house, and I watered the ass and gave him hay. And I took out the silver and placed it in the hand of my father Terah. And when he saw it, he was glad. And he said, you are blessed, Abraham, by the God of my Elohim, since you have brought me the price for the Elohim so that my labor was not in vain. And answering, I said to him, listen, Father Terah, the Elohim are blessing in, in you because you are an Elohim for them because you made them for their blessing is their perdition and their power is vain. They did not help themselves. How then can they help you or bless me? I was good for you in this transaction, for though my good through through my good sense, I brought you the silver for the smashed Elohim. And when he heard my speech, he became furiously angry with me because I had spoken harsh words against his Elohim. Chapter five. But having pondered my father's anger, I went out. And afterward, when I had gone out, he called me saying, Abraham, and I said, here I am. And he said, Up, gather wood chips, for I was making gods from fur before you came, and prepare with them food for my midday meal. And it came to pass when I was choosing the wooden chips, I found among them a small god which would fit in my left hand. And on its forehead was written, God Barasat. And it came to pass when I put the chips on the fire in order to prepare the food for my father and going out to inquire about the food, I put Barasat near the kindling fire, saying to him threateningly, Barasat, watch that the fire does not go out before I come back. If the fire goes out, blow on it so it flares up. I went out and I made my counsel. And when I returned, I found Barasat falling on his back, his feet enveloped by fire and burning fiercely. And it came to pass when I saw it, I laughed and said to myself, Barasat, truly you know how to light a fire and cook food. And it came to pass while I was saying this in my laughter, I saw that he burnt up slowly from the fire and became ashes. I carried the food to my father to eat, 
I gave him wine and milk, and he drank, and he enjoyed himself. And he blessed Maramoth the god. And I said to him, Father Terra, do not bless Maramoth your god. Do not praise him. Praise rather Barasat your god, because as though loving you, he threw himself into the fire in order to cook your food. And he said to me, Then, where is he now? And I said, He is burned in the fierceness of the fire and become dust. And he said, Great is the power of Barasat. I will make another today, and tomorrow he will prepare my food. Chapter 6. When I, Abraham, heard words like this from my father, I laughed in my mind. And I groaned in the bitterness and anger of my soul. I said, how then is a figment of a body made by him, Terra, an aid for my father? Or can he have subordinated his body to his soul, his soul to, to his spirit, and the spirit to stupidity and ignorance? And I said, it is only proper to endure evil that I may throw my mind to purity and I will expose my thoughts clearly to him. I answered and said, Father Terra, whichever of these Elohim you extol, you err in your thought. Behold, the Elohim of my brother Nahor standing in the holy sanctuary are more venerable than yours. For behold, uh, I guess that's Zauchaos, my brother Nahor's Elohim is more venerable than your Elohim Maromoth, because he is made of gold, valued by man. And if he grows old with time, he will be remolded. Whereas Merimoth, Merimoth, if he is changed or broken, will not be renewed because he is stone. What about uh, Yav, the Elohim on the other Elohim, who stands with Zauchaos. For he is also more venerable than the Elohim Barasat. He is carved from wood and forged from silver, because he too is a term of comparison, being valued by man according to external experience. But Barasat, your Elohim, when he was still not carved, rooted in the earth, being great and wondrous with branches and flowers and praise. But you made him with an axe, and by your skill he was made an Elohim. And behold, he has already dried up, and his fatness has perished. He fell from the height to the earth, and he came from greatness to smallness, and the appearance of his face wasted away. And he himself was burned up by the fire, and he became ashes, and is no more. And you say, let me make another, and tomorrow he will make my food for me. But in perishing he left himself no strength for his own destruction. Chapter 7 this I say, fire is more venerable in formation, for even the undubbed things are subdued in it, and it mocks that which perishes easily by means of its burning. But neither is it venerable, for it is subject to the waters. But rather, the waters are more venerable than it fire, because they overcome fire and sweeten the earth with fruits. But I will not call them God either, for the waters subside under the earth and are subject to it. But I will not call it a goddess either, for it is dried by the sun and subordinated to man for his work. More venerable among the gods, I say, is the sun, for with its rays it illuminates the whole universe and the various airs. Nor will I place among the gods the one who obscures his courses by means of the moon and the clouds. Nor again shall I call the moon or the stars gods, because they too at times during the night dim their light. Listen, tear up my father. I shall seek before you the God who created all the gods supposed by us to exist. For who is it, or which one is it, who made the heavens crimson and the sun golden, who has given light to the moon and the stars with it, who has dried the earth in the midst of the many waters, who set yourself among the things and who has sought me out in the perplexity of my thoughts? I, only God, will reveal himself by himself to us. Now, this just occurred to me before I get to chapter eight. There's an interesting theme being played out here with the fire. And there's a lot of, of fire themes with Abraham. And what we find in other texts like Jasher and um, uh, also uh, in the Aramaic Targum, that 
Abraham was thrown into a fiery furnace. Also, uh, the writings of Abraham talks about this. Uh, Nimrod tried to burn him. Yes. And what, what, now what's fascinating about this is we see that God burned, uh, that this idol burned. Abraham was not able to be burned. But there's more to it on an esoteric level because in, it is in the recognitions of Clement uh, that, that says that it was Nimrod who introduced to the world the worship of fire. And what I think this means is that he was the first to begin passing children through the flames. The mm. reason being is that we see in Peter, uh, and I, I talked about with this last time, but there was a there was a cutoff with the with the Noah's flood, where Yah said that's gonna be the last time that he destroys the world with water. From this point on, he's gonna destroy it with fire. Well, I in my group, I we've opened up a book called the the Book of Limic of Cain, which uh, was reportedly you know written before the flood. And it, it talks about how the sons of Cain worshipped water. They worshipped Leviathan. And they would pass their children through mm -hmm. the, the water. And the idea was is that they were trying to immortalize their children. This is why parents would pass their child through the flames uh, to immortalize them. And we see Homer talking about it in his poems. Point being is that we know that before the flood, they were unrepentant of their sins. They knew the flood was coming. And they're like, you know what? The water's coming. There's nothing we can do about it, but we can immortalize ourselves through this. And obviously it didn't work out well for them. The same thing is happening with the fire. Nimrod was the first guy to put this together and be like, okay, fire judgment's coming. We're going to be thrown into Gehenna. So we need to uh, do something to, you know, be able to overcome these flames. This is what the worship of fire is about, in my opinion. And so it's interesting that just to, just wanted to throw this out there that this God is being burned by fire, but it doesn't talk about in this text but we know abraham was unable to be burned by fire and that's you know that's Yah giving the message look if you want to if you don't want to be burned in the flames at gehenna be righteous follow my ways right and obviously yeah. nimrod didn't want to do that all right moving on to chapter eight we have a lot to cover obviously and it yes. came to pass and it came to pass as i was thinking things like these with regards to my father tara and the court of my house the voice of the mighty one came down from the heavens in a stream of fire saying and calling Abraham, Abraham. And I said, here I am. And he said, you are searching of the Elohim of Elohim, the creator. And in the understanding of your heart, I am he. Go out from Terah, your father, and go out of the house that you too may not be slain in the sins of your father's house. And it came to pass as I went out, I was not yet outside the entrance of the court that the sound of a great thunder came and burned him in his house and everything in his house down to the ground, 40 cubits. Well, there you go. Back to you, chapter nine. Uh, and now that we have reached chapter 9, there are uh, two translations. So I'll read the first translation, and then you read the second translation of chapter 9. All right, continuing. Then a voice came speaking to me twice, Abraham, Abraham. And I said, Here I am. And he said, Behold, it is I, fear not, for I am before the world. And mighty, the God who created previously, before the light of the age. I am the protector for you, and I am your helper. Go, get me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old she-goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a pigeon. And make me a pure sacrifice. And in this sacrifice I will place the ages. I will announce to you guarded things. And you will see great things which you have not seen, because you desired to search for me, and I called you, my beloved. But for forty days abstain from every kind of food cooked by fire, and from drinking of wine, and from anointing yourself with oil. And then you shall set out for me the sacrifices which I have commanded you in the place which I will show you on a high mountain, and there I will show you the things which were made by the ages and by my word, and affirmed, created, and renewed. And I will announce to you in them what will come upon those who have done evil and just things in the race of man. All right, starting from the top again, now I'll just throw out there really quick. I was really excited to see that uh, the 40 days, which, you know, Yahushua uh -huh. did as well. And that's such an important number in terms of, uh, uh, of judgments and, and so on and so forth. All right, starting from the top. 
then a voice came to me speaking twice, Abraham, Abraham. And I said, here I am. And he said, behold, it is I. Fear not, for I am with you, for I am before the ages. Even the mighty Elohim who created the first light of the world, I am your shield and your helper. Go, take me a young heifer of three years, and a she-goat of three years, and a ram of three years, a turtle dove and a pigeon, and bring me a pure sacrifice. And in the sacrifice I will lay before you the ages, ages to come, and make known to you what is reserved. And you shall see great things which you have not hitherto seen. Because you have loved to search me out, and I have named you my friend, but abstain from every form of food that comes forth out of the fire, and from the drinking of wine, and from anointing yourself with oil for forty days, and then set forth for me the sacrifice which I have commanded you, and a place which I will show you on a high mountain, and there I will show you the ages which have been created and established by my, um, I think it, is it in there? By my, I think the commentary ends there. The age, uh, going to verse 10, the ages and my word and word, and I will make known to affirm, created, renewed you, which shall come to pass. And I will announce to you in them on those who have done evil, what will come upon those who and righteousness in the, am I reading this right? I feel like I messed this up. And I've done evil and just things in the generations of men. Okay. I oh, think wait, I got wait, a little wait. watch. It. Yeah. Wait a second. Um, um, hold, hold on. on. Okay, stand by. I got this. I know. I know where you it, where you stopped. It says, "Created and established by my word, and I will make known to you what shall come to pass in them on those who have done evil and righteousness in the generations okay. of men." Yeah, I see that. Okay, cool. All right, and um, I just want to point out that before we go into chapter ten, that. Um, that that number 40 is so significant because you know we see the um the the spies when they're sent into canaan the 12 spies only two give good reports 10 give bad they were in canaan for 10 uh, i'm sorry 40 days and because of israel's rebellion they had to wander for 40 years 40 years a, yes yeah it was the same thing with david and goliath he comes and challenges israel for 40 days 40 days and, yes yeah, and because David's the only one that steps up, he gets 40 years as a king. So it's really interesting, and it's the same thing. Where it's so that's what excited me when I see the the 40 day challenge with yeah. Abraham, mm -hmm. and I assume he passed it, and of course Yahusha did as well. So yeah, uh, yes, okay, chapter 10, and yes, good points. And it came to pass when I heard the voice pronouncing such words to me that I looked this way and that, and behold, there was no breath of man, and my spirit was amazed, and my soul fled from me, and I became like a stone and fell face down upon the earth, for there was no longer strength in me to stand up on the earth. And while I was still face down on the ground, I heard the voice speaking, Go, Yahweh, of the same name, through the meditation of my ineffable name, consecrate this man for me and strengthen him against his trembling. The angel he sent to me in the likeness of a man came and he took me by my right hand and stood me on my feet and he said to me, Stand up, Abraham of God, who has loved you. Let human trembling not enfold you. For lo, I am sent to you to strengthen you and to bless you in the name of God, creator of heavenly and earthly things, who has loved you. Be bold and hasten to him. I am Yahoel, and I was called so by him, who causes those with me on the seventh expanse, on the firmament, to shake a power through the medium of his ineffable name. In me, I am the one who has been charged according to his commandment to restrain the threats of the living creatures of the cherubim against one another and i teach those who carry the song through the medium of man's night of the seventh hour i am appointed to hold the leviathans because through me is subjugated the attack and menace of every reptile i am ordered to loosen hades and to destroy those who wondered at the dead. I am the one who ordered your father's house 
to be burned with him. For he honored the dead. I am sent to you now to bless you and the land which he, whom you have called the Eternal One, has prepared for you. For your sake I have indicated the way of the land. Stand up, Abraham. Go boldly. Be very joyful and rejoice, and I also rejoice with you. For a venerable honor has been prepared for you by the Eternal One. Go, complete the sacrifice of the command. Behold, I am assigned to be with you and with the generation which is predestined to be born from you. And with me, Michael blesses you forever. Be bold and go. Back up on the top. I'll be reading from the book this time. I switched the PDF before. And it came to pass when I heard the voice of him who spoke such words to me, and I looked here and there, I found no breath in me, and my spirit was frightened, and my soul seemed as departed from me, for I fell down as a stone, as a dead man upon the earth, and had no more strength to stand. And I, while I was thus lying with my face toward the earth, I heard the voice of the, the Holy One speaking, Go, Jael, and by means of my ineffable, ineffable name, raise up yonder oh. man and strengthen him. Uh, all right there. We'll- yeah, we'll pick it up on the other side. We'll be right back. This book. As a bookstore for truth seekers, it's our goal to make ancient manuscripts, which were once held captive by secretive institutions, available for public consideration. In our generation, where wisdom has increased, as Daniel the prophet foretold, we have access to many of the testimonies our early church brethren were persecuted for preserving. After being hidden for centuries, these manuscripts have been leaked from various sources throughout the earth, and it's our goal to gather these sources into printable form to make available for all who seek the ancient way. If you're looking to deepen your studies of the biblical narrative, find these ancient manuscripts and more at sacredwordpublishing.com. When Justin and I found out we were having a little girl, we named her Eliana and started dreaming of what life would be like with her, where we would take her, what we would teach her, and of course, what we would read to her. One day we walked around a bookstore looking for books we might want for her and found nothing. So we started brainstorming what exactly we would want. Even from a young age, we wanted her to know and understand the heart of God and hidden truths that are in ancient biblical manuscripts like the Book of Enoch and the idea of the Prophecy for Children series was born. Justin got hard to work and Praise Yah released the Prophecy for Children series. We are grateful for the support and amazing feedback from others who have been wanting the same for their children. We just found out we will be having a son and we are excited to grow our family and to keep writing books for our children to share with our truth-seeking family. To order these books today, please check out the children's store at sacredwordpublishing.com. Your partnership with Sacred Word Publishing goes further than the publishing of ancient manuscripts and weekly video content. You also make a huge impact across the earth in orphanages in Myanmar, India, Uganda, and Kenya. Your support is crucial for the development of the Ecclesia of Real Truth Seekers. We thank you for joining us in hosting Secrets Revealed, Momentary Zen, the Digital Readers Club, Ask Me Anything series, and other shows that have helped lead so many to the truth of salvation. 
become even more involved, please visit patreon.com slash sacredwordpublishing where you can partake in exclusive, interactive, patron-only content and help us continue shining the light of love in this darkened world. everybody for a second hour uh the show is going by quickly i'll turn it back over to you Noel, and uh, we, you can continue on all right right where i left off and by means of my ineffable name raise up yonder man and strengthen him so that he recovers from his trembling and the angel whom he had sent came to me in the likeness of a man and grasped me by my right hand and stood me on my feet and he said to me stand up abraham friend of Elohim who has loved you. Let human trembling not enfold you. For lo, I am sent to you to strengthen you and to bless you in the name of Elohim, creator of heavenly and earthly things, who has loved you. But hold and hasten to him. I am, uh, I guess that's Yel, and I was called so by him who causes those with me on the seventh expanse, on the firmament, to shake a power through the medium of his ineffable name in me. I am, oh, I just, oh my goodness, I'm just reading the wrong column again. Let me, sorry, Zen, let me try this again. <laughs> Stand up. <laughs> you could have you just jumped in there. Uh, I, you know, I'll, okay, I just whatever. saw that you were so, on the wrong one. Yeah, yeah, I changed columns. I like, I, I did this in your, I did this in uh, France all the time. I was driving, no, in uh, the UK. I'm sorry, I was driving on the wrong side of the street all the time. It was awful. <laughs> oh, goodness. At least you didn't uh, hit anybody. <laughs> I did not. Stand up, Abraham, friend of Elohim who loves you. Let not the trembling of man seize you. For lo, I have been sent to you to strengthen you and bless you in the name of Elohim who loves you, the creator of the celestial and the terrestrial. Be fearless and hasten to him. I am called uh, Jael by him who moves those who exist with me on the seventh expanse over the heavens, a power and virtue of the ineffable name that is dwelling in me. I am the one who has been given to restrain according to his commandment, the threatening attacks of the living ones, of the cherubim against one another, and to teach those who carry him the song of the seventh hour of the night of man. I am ordered to restrain the Leviathan, for every single attack and menace of every single reptile and subject are subject unto me. I am he who has been commissioned to loosen Hades and destroy him who stares at the dead. I have been sent to bless you now, and the land which the Eternal One, whom you have invoked, has prepared for you, and for your sake I have winded my way upon earth. Stand up, Abraham. Go without fear. Be right, glad, and rejoice, and I am with you. For age-lasting honor has been prepared for you by the Eternal One. Go fulfill the sacrifices commanded, for lo, I have been appointed to be with you and with the generations that will spring from you. And with me, Michael blesses you forever. Be of good cheer and go. Chapter 11. And I stood up and I saw him who had taken my right hand and set me on my feet. The appearance of his body was like sapphire and the aspect of his face was like chrysolite and the hair of his head like snow. And a Kadaris was on his head. It looked that of a rainbow, and the clothing of his garments was purple. And a golden staff was in his right hand. And he said to me, Abraham. And I said, Here is your servant. And he said, Let my appearance not frighten you, nor my speech trouble your soul. Come with me, and I will go with you visible until the sacrifice. But after the sacrifice, 
invisible forever. Be bold and go. This sounds like one fascinating angel back on the top. Uh -huh. And I rose... And I rose up and saw him who had grasped me by the right hand and set me upon my feet. And the appearance of his body was like sapphire and the look of his countenance like chrysolite and the hair of his head like snow and the turban on his head like the appearance of the rainbow and the clothing of his garments like purple and a golden scepter was in his right hand. And he said to me, Abraham, and I said, here am I, your servant. And he said, let not my appearance frighten you, nor my speech, and your soul be not troubled. Come with me, and I will be with you, visible until the sacrifice, but after the sacrifice, always invisible. Be of good cheer and come. Chapter 12. And we went, the two of us alone, together, forty days and nights, and I ate no bread and drank no water, because my food was to see the angel who was with me and his discourse with me was my drink. We came to God's mountain, glorious Horeb, and I said to the angel, Singer of the Eternal One, behold, I have no sacrifice with me, nor do I know a place for an altar on the mountain. So how shall I make the sacrifice? And he said, Look behind you. And I looked behind me, and behold, all the prescribed sacrifices were following us. The calf, the she-goat, the ram, the turtle dove, and the pigeon. And the angel said to me, Abraham. And I said, Here I am. And he said to me, Slaughter all these and divide the animals exactly into halves, but do not cut the birds apart. And give them to the men whom I will show you, standing beside you, for they are the altar on the mountain to offer sacrifice to the Eternal One. The turtle dove and the pigeon you will give to me, for I will ascend on the wings of the birds to show you what is in the heavens, on the earth and in the sea, in the abyss and in the lower depths, in the Garden of Eden and in its rivers in the fullness of the universe, and you will see its circles in all. I'm just curious then, before I read from the top, do you have any uh, cross-references to this particular angel? No. Do you? Did you pull up something? No, I'm, well, he sounds fascinating. I mean, he, he, yeah. has, a lot of, he has a lot of Yahusha uh, characteristics. He reminds me a little bit of the angel in Revelation that comes, uh, has like, uh, he steps onto the land, he's got a rainbow around him. Um, but anyways, mm -hmm. uh, reading, reading from the top. Also, Maybe I wanna... um, on the next break, you can look up Yael and see what comes up. Yeah. And we went, the two of us, together for 40 days and nights, and I ate no bread and drank no water, because my food and my drink was to see the angel who was with me and to hear his speech. I mean, this right here just reminds me of, you know, we talk about, you know, Yahusha being our our, our bread and our water, just that, yeah, you know, yeah. that, that, that just comes to mind right there. It's very powerful mm -hmm. in, my, in my mind. And we came to the Mount of Elohim, Mount Horeb, and I said to the angel, singer of the eternal one. I have no sacrifice with me, nor am I aware of the place of an altar on the mountain. How can I bring a sacrifice? And he said to me, look around you. And when I looked around, they're following us were all the prescribed animals, the young heifer, the she-goat, the ram, the turtle dove, and the pigeon. I love this passage too, because it just, it, it, it when it, when you go into the Yitchak account, when he's going to, you know, yeah. Yitchak is carrying the wood and he's like, well, where's the sacrifice? And he says, you know, uh, Elohim will provide one. And he, he knew like he, you know, with this experience here, he'd just seen that he provided it. And so yeah, uh, right. by experience. Right. And the angel, and the angel said to me, Abraham. And I said, here, here am I. And he said, slaughter all these animals and divide them into halves. And, the one against the other, but do not sever the birds and give these to the men whom I will show you standing by you. For these are the altar upon the mountain to offer a sacrifice to the eternal. But the turtle dove and the pigeon give to me for I will ascend upon the wings of the bird so that you may be able to see in heaven and upon earth and in the sea and in the abyss and in the underworld and in the garden of Eden and in its rivers and in the fullness of the whole world and in its circle 
you shall gaze into them all. Chapter 13. And I did everything according to the angel's command. And I gave the angels who had come to us the divided parts of the animals. And the angel I.O.L. took the two birds. And I waited for the evening gift. And an unclean bird flew down on the carcasses. And I drove it away. And the unclean bird spoke to me and said, What are you doing, Abraham, on the holy heights where no one eats or drinks? Nor is there upon them food for men. But these all will be consumed by fire, and they will burn you up. Leave the man who is with you and flee. For if you ascend to the height, they will destroy you. And it came to pass when I saw the bird speaking. I said this to the angel. What is this, my Lord? And he said, this is disgrace. This is Azazel. And he said to him, shame on you, Azazel, for Abraham's portion is in heaven and yours is on the earth. For you have selected here and become enamored of the swelling place of your blemish. Therefore, the eternal ruler, the mighty one, has given you a dwelling on earth. Through you, the all evil spirit is a liar, and through you are wrath and trials on the generations of men who live impiously. For the eternal mighty one did not allow the bodies of the righteous to be in your hand. So through them, the righteous life is affirmed and the destruction of ungodliness. Here, Counselor, be shamed by me. You have no permission to tempt all the righteous. Depart from this man. You cannot deceive him because he is the enemy of you and those who follow you and who love what you wish. For behold, the garment which is in heaven was formerly yours has been set aside for him and the corruption which was on him has gone over to you. Now, before you read, I think uh, we should highlight this that is said. Um, specifically, you know, this angel Azazel, which um, if you look in the traditions of the Jews written by Johann Eisenminger, he speaks about how Azazel and Samael and Satan, the the title of the adversary that these are all the the same entities um i know some other people think differently but um from what i see in this particular text azazel is also ascribed as being the one that beguiles eve which we'll get into in a short time in a short space and he's also said to be the one that um the children of Cain are derived from. And so, you know, we know that also to be uh, the serpent Samael, the viper of God, the angel of death. And here it says that, you know, he selected this place that um, he was cast out of the heavens and that his place is now here on the earth and that he's been given authority over those who are of the impious. And so, you know, he's been given the right to rule over those that deny the the Most High and that fall away into sin. Um, and so, and also that his garment, um, there's a, uh, a book called The Enthronement of Michael, which speaks about how when he led the angels in rebellion and then, you know, the war in heaven and he was cast out that his fir first and former estate, which he was, you know, the greatest and foremost angel of the most high at that time, that that was taken from him and that he, his robes and his garment was given to Michael and that Michael became the leader of the angelic hierarchy after Christ, who is, and holds dominion uh, and is the true leadership, the true morning star, you know, being the son of God, he is different than 
the angels that were created by them. But uh, so let me get you to comment on that, and then you can read this chapter. Well, I, what I what I was doing while you were reading, actually, I was trying to look up this um, this Yol or uh, Jehol yeah, yeah. angel. And this is what came up. I, I wasn't finding much. And this kind of all ties into what you're talking about. Before I get to that, so, okay, so we have Azazel. Clearly, he's from the Book of Enoch. Uh, and then, of course, mm -hmm. you're making the connection that this is the same as Hasatan. And you're right, people debate this. According to this book, they're the one and the same. So, yeah. uh, but this is where we're going to go back to the, the Book of Enoch. This is what I was able to find. He, he There's not a lot on him. He has a wiki page. And it, and it, it says Yahol or Jehol uh, is a name of an angel appearing specifically in the manuscripts of Apocalypse of Abraham. So apparently he, uh, he okay. appears in here. Nope. But but uh, here's a couple of things about him that's interesting that we already read. He is an associate of Michael and Michael is the uh, protector of Israel. And uh, he's charged to restrain Leviathan. And that's really interesting because the more I read about Leviathan, the more I understand that Leviathan is a almost a, a symbolic of death in many ways uh, on an esoteric and exoteric level. But this is where it gets really interesting. Uh, the the name Yahol, many people think, is one of Metatron seventy names, uh, which would be Enoch. So okay, that's a that's a that's a theory. Oh, and it's it yeah it is interesting that this may be we've got again azazel enoch and they yes, were right. going back and forth in enoch and again we see it again so just point that out yeah very interesting uh with the whole thing of uh iol and if this is you know one of the names of metatron and if this is um enoch and somehow you know when he was given a bright nature to um, a, a glorious form. That's a uh, that's really interesting. All right. So should I go back to? The, I think yeah. we're on chapter thirteen, correct? Yeah, right. chapter thirteen, the right side. Yeah. So and, and just you know, I kind of want to point this out too that there's many different people throughout Scripture that have uh, kind of messianic features um or characteristics uh yosef is a huge mm -hmm. one david is a big one yes, abraham true. is a big one but so is enoch yes. uh enoch enoch was a and even clear... moshe yeah moshe so yeah. it's just interesting that uh if this is enoch that actually makes more sense to me because i'm like who is this angel if it's not uh, yeshua because it sure does sound like you know a lot of characteristics but a very almost a messianic figure, a very anointed figure, and it just Enoch make you know just rings in my mind. It makes a lot of sense. So, mm -hmm. uh, moving on, top of thirteen again. And I did everything according to the command of the angel and gave the angels who had come to us the divided animals. But the angel Jael took the birds, and I waited until the evening sacrifice. And there flew an unclean bird down upon the carcasses, and I drove it away. And the unclean bird spoke to me and said, Abraham, what are you doing upon these holy heights where no man eats or drinks, nor is there upon them the food of man, but these heavenly beings consume everything with fire and will burn you up. Forsake the man who is with you and flee, for if you ascend into the heights, they will make an end of. And it came to pass when I saw the bird speak, I said to the angel, what is this, my Adonai? And he said, this is ungodliness. This is Azazel. And he said to it, Disgrace upon you, Azazel, for Abraham's lot is in heaven, but yours is upon the earth. That that seems very that that now that I think about it, that seems very Enoch right there. Mm -hmm. Because you have chosen and loved this for the dwelling place of your uncleanness, therefore the eternal mighty Yahuwah made you to be a dweller upon the earth, and through you every evil ruach of lies. Well, there, there's another Satan connection right there. Mm -hmm, and right. and through and through you, wrath and trials for the generations of ungodly men. For Elohim, the eternal mighty one, has not permitted that the bodies of the righteous should be in your hand, the hand of the accuser, in order that thereby the life of the righteous and the destruction of the unclean may be assured. Hear this, my friend, and be gone with shame from me. For it has not been given to you to play the tempter in regard to all the righteous. Depart from this man. You cannot lead him astray. 
He is an enemy to you and to those who follow you and love what you desire. For behold, the vesture which is which in heaven was formerly yours has been set aside for him. Ouch. And the mortality which was his has been transferred to you. I mean, that that's a clear reference there to the throne that Satan was um uh was in, or in this case, Azazel, mm -hmm. and and the fact that you know it's it's like that had to hurt right there, you know. That's right, right. This, uh, like you know, you want that thrown back. It's going to this guy and his people. So right, yeah. And the, here's the other thing too that even though in the um, enthronement of Michael, that Michael was took um, Satan's seat in the heavens, it is. Because you know they fell and they were plus put under the authority of death, so the seats, the one third of the angels that fell from heaven, their seats would be filled by humans, and so it would make sense to me, you know, that Enoch was, you know, because he's been given this special privilege of that he was taken up and made into the angel Metatron, but at the end of days he would return as one of the two witnesses. And then at that time, you know, with Elijah, they would be killed. And then they would, you know, in three and a half days later, they go back into the heavens. But, um, and so the one third, and even the 200 watchers that left their place of habitation, their positions are to be filled by humans. And so Abraham, of course, is of the seed of Adam. And it is from the line and the lineage of Adam that they will take over uh, these positions and actually judge the fallen angels at the end times. And so, um, and also the, in Psalms 82, we see that they, because of the war in heaven and because of the destruction of the earth, they are placed under the authority of death. That when the earth was moved out of place and the foundations turn over destroyed in that particular chapter. It says that the sons of God would die the death of men and that they were placed under the authority of death at that time. And then they took on when they came into this world and were banished and held in this world, as it says in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, Satan at the end of the seven or 6,000 years or 7,000 years that he would die the death of a man. And so um, that that is also linked to this, I believe. All right. Do you want to comment? And then I'll move forward. Well, I was going to add one more thing on. Sure. I'm, just, I'm still reading on uh, Jehol, which is really interesting. There's one more source that uh, I don't know if this uh, identifies him as Enoch or takes that position away. But according to Gustav Davidson's A Dictionary of Angels, including the Fallen Angels, 1967, uh, he claims that Jehol, and I don't know where he's sourcing this. Um, I'm just quoting his, his dictionary. He claims that Jehol uh, is the chief angel of the seraphim. Now, I don't know if, if Enoch would have become a seraphim. And seraphim, as you, you know, as you know, are, are the kind of the fiery serpentine yes. creatures. Uh, yeah, the, the dragon. You know, yeah. yeah, yeah, the reptilians dragon and all that angels, kind of stuff. Yes. But, but even that is, is interesting in and of itself. If, um, if Hasatan is also a seraphim, or I used to say Azazel, that you have the, the chief, I assume this chief angel would have probably replaced him. Um, you know, so you can you would have here this conflict between, you know, the two, the two chief, you know, the, the prince of darkness and the prince of the seraphim. So, right. Yeah. Cause, um, not all of the seraphim fell. Yeah, there were, you know, the, and those that did join, um, Satan and his rebellion, they were called seraphim angels and they were the dragon like entities that we see the feathered serpent, the opinion dragons, you know, the winged reptiles that were worshipped in antediluvian times but there uh there is a holy class of seraphim angels they're the six-winged angels and they're higher than the cherubim and they surround the throne of god and they are part of the heavenly choir which sings to him uh in daily basis so the first time the first time i read that that really tripped me out to go wait there's like 
like these like reptilian dragons in front of the throne like that really tripped me out right but right, the, yeah. this the scene i really like uh, i read it in the book of the two pearls and it's a, a it's like called like it's a section called the book of enoch the prophet or whatever but it's where he's taken up to heaven um the the chariot of fire comes and gets him and there it says that there's like seraphim uh dragons in this this whirlwind that takes them up and it's a scene straight out of the ending of raiders of the lost ark where like the, uh, the eyeballs yeah, and, yeah. Of, uh, melt of all the people that are trying to get them right. but you know those are like the, the the good seraphim that come and get them yes yes exactly uh well we are almost to break and so i really uh don't think it's um you know, uh, we'll we'll pick up on the chapter when we come back, but uh, it's crazy how fast this show is going. Um, but, anyways, do you want to make mention really quickly again of um, just the books that you have released, uh, in and where people can go to find them? Of course, it's sacredwordpublishing.com, dot com, but uh, maybe yeah. your radio shows and your website stuff too as well. Yeah, just so we the, have the, this minute remaining. The the two latest are obviously our Millennial Kingdom plus Mud Flood. That's the big one that people are talking about. And I don't answer everybody's questions in that, but um I you know it was a it was a problem solving uh book for myself and uh, you know, you see me working through a lot of issues, uh, and I, I don't try to hide that fact in there. And the other one, of course, is uh, Exile to Aftermath. And then I'm from The Unexpected Cosmology. That's my YouTube channel. That's my Discord page. It's my website, The Unexpected Cosmology. I do a lot of stuff there. Cool, man. I'm looking forward to checking out that book, too. All right. We'll be right back, everyone, for our final thing. As a bookstore for truth seekers, it's our goal to make ancient manuscripts which were once held captive by secretive institutions available for public consideration. In our generation where wisdom has increased as Daniel the prophet foretold, we have access to many of the testimonies our early church brethren were persecuted for preserving. After being hidden for centuries, these manuscripts have been leaked from various sources throughout the earth and it's our goal to gather these sources into printable form to make available for all who seek the ancient way. If you're looking to deepen your studies of the biblical narrative, find these ancient manuscripts and more at sacredwordpublishing.com. When Justin and I found out we were having a little girl, we named her Eliana and started dreaming of what life would be like with her, where we would take her, what we would teach her, and of course, what we would read to her. One day we walked around a bookstore looking for books we might want for her and found nothing. So we started brainstorming what exactly we would want. Even from a young age, we wanted her to know and understand the heart of God and hidden truths that are in ancient biblical manuscripts like the Book of Enoch, and the idea of the Prophecy for Children series was born. Justin got hard to work and Praise Yah released the Prophecy for Children series. We are grateful for the support and amazing feedback from others who have been wanting the same for their children. We just found out we will be having a son, and we are excited to grow our family and to keep writing books for our children to share with our truth-seeking family. To order these books today, please check out the children's store at sacredwordpublishing.com. Your partnership with Sacred Word Publishing goes further than the publishing of ancient manuscripts and weekly video content. You also make a huge impact across the earth in orphanages in Myanmar, India, Uganda, and Kenya. Your support is crucial for the development of the Ecclesia of Real Truth Seekers. 
We thank you for joining us in hosting Secrets Revealed, Momentary Zen, the Digital Readers Club, Ask Me Anything series, and other shows that have helped lead so many to the truth of salvation. Become even more involved? Please visit patreon.com slash sacredwordpublishing where you can partake in exclusive, interactive, patron-only content and help us continue shining the light of love in this darkened world. Welcome back, everybody, for a final segment. We are continuing with the Apocalypse of Abraham. I am joined by author and good friend Noel Hadley as we cover um, and going through this particular teaching. And chapter 14. And the angel said to me, Abraham, and I said, Here I am, your servant. And he said, No, from this, that the Eternal One whom you have loved, has chosen you. Be bold and do through your authority whatever I order you against him who reviles justice. Will I not be able to revile him who has scattered about the earth the secrets of heaven, who has taken counsel against the mighty one? Say to him, may you be the first brand of the furnace of the earth. Go, Azazel into the untrodden parts of the earth, for your heritage is over those who are with you, with the stars and with the men born by the clouds, whose portion you are indeed. They exist through your being. Enmity is for you a pious act. Therefore, through your own destruction, be gone from me. And I said the words as the angel had taught me. And he said, Abraham. And I said, here, I am your servant. And the angel said to me, answer him not. And he spoke to me a second time. And the angel said, now, whatever he says to you, answer him not, lest his will will run up to you. For the eternal mighty one gave him the gravity and the will. Answer him not. And I did what? The angel had commanded me, and whatever he said to me about the descent, I answered him not. Uh, one thing, just want to bring this up really quickly, and then you know you can answer and go into your chapter. But here it says that for your heritage is over those who are with you, with the stars, and with the men born by the clouds whose portion you are and so i take that to mean you know the angels legion the one third of the angels which joined him in rebellion and also those that born of the flesh who like the illuminati and the bloodlines of cain uh of are of their father the devil the assassins of the prophets uh that they are those that are of his portion and so um it's interesting to me also as we go into uh, and get to the story of the garden that we'll see again that these people are actually derived from Azazel. No. Yeah, I that that phrase there, I've never seen that before where it says men born by the clouds. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. And it's interesting because the context is with the stars. And so there is. Right. 
there there seems to be that seems to be right there a a, a clear genesis genesis six account you know what i love though before i read my side you know the, the side i i'm reading that the, the right hand column is i tend to like a lot of those translations better but i don't think it has this line on it which you read in verse four and it says will i not be able to revile him who has scattered about the earth the secrets of heaven right and, right yes and man and i love this this is so profound and it right. has taken me it has taken me years and years and years to appreciate this when i first came to the truth one of the things i started researching very early on was the mystery religions. I wanted to understand the mystery religions and, and what they were advocating and how they have manifested themselves in the modern world around us, especially with, you know, like uh, space and, and, you know, NASA and just, you know, everything out there. And there was a, there's a line which this connects with in Enoch, which where Yahuwah tells Enoch to tell the watchers as Azel, you know, they, they get, Enoch is their spokesman to go to the Most High. And he says, the Most High tells Enoch to tell them, you had all the worth, of, you had all the mysteries of heaven, but they were, or you gave them all the mysteries of heaven, but they were worthless. They were worthless mysteries. And the idea here is that, uh, keep in mind, um, what, did, what did the Watchers bring down? They, they gave humanity a sword. They, they taught them right. what a sword was. Well, we know that swords swords come from heaven, right? Well, mm -hmm. the idea of a worthless mystery is that they did not instruct humanity in Yah's uh, set-apart ways, his instructions in righteous living. That's what they didn't do, and that's what made all these mysteries worthless. The reason I say it took me a long time to appreciate this is that when I first came into the truth movement, I would say, like, if, if any of these other religious movements or organizations, whatever, teach anything, that's proof that it's, it's, it's uh, false. But, and I didn't appreciate what, what these worthless mysteries are, you know, that, that they actually, the watchers right. gave a lot of truth to humanity. Yeah. They just, yeah. So, you know, and that has helped me a lot looking through these extra biblical texts and other things like that. So right. start, uh, one, start one last thing too, uh, is that remember that, it is to Azazel that all sin is ascribed. And so the, I think this fits with why that is as well, because he is the leader of all the rebel angels and the fallen watchers. And, you know, he beguiled Eve and led them also to lust after the daughters of Cain. And so um, I think, you know, this is part of that, all the secrets of heaven, as it says uh, here. Yeah. All right. Starting back up at the top, chapter 14. Obviously, we're um, we're going to we have like 20 minutes left. And I think we'll get, you know, probably halfway through this. And just so everyone out there listening, the last half is the really great, yeah. like really right. meaty stuff. Like we're just we're kind of like running the marathon right now to get up to that point, And we're going right. to cover it next time. All right. Yes. And the angel said to me, know that from henceforth the eternal one has chosen you. Be of good courage and use this authority so far as I bid you against him who slanders the truth. Should I not be able to put him to shame who has scattered over the earth the secrets of heaven? Well, there it is. It says it there too. Uh, he has scattered over the earth the secrets of heaven and has rebelled against the mighty one. Say to him, become the burning coal of the furnace of the earth. Go, Azazel, into the inaccessible parts of the earth, for your heritage is to be over those who are with you, the ones brought forth with the stars and clouds, and with the men whose portion you are, even those who exist on account of your being. That's interesting. So yeah. there are some there are some that exist because of him. Of so, him, exactly. Justification shall be your enemy. Now depart from me by your perdition. And I uttered the words that the angel taught me. And then the angel said to me, answer him not, for Elohim has given him power over those who answer him. Well, that's really interesting. Uh, I could get into some uh, legal ramifications with that, but that's actually spot on. Uh, that, what he just said there, the tactic works the same way for the IRS, just so everybody knows. And the angel spoke to me again, saying, mm -hmm. however, much, however much he speak to you, answer him not. 
in order that he may have no free access to you because the er eternal one has given him weight and will in this respect. And I did that, which was commanded me by the angel. And no matter how much he spoke to me, I answered him nothing whatsoever, which that, that is a, uh, wow. That is some really good advice. Uh, yes. Just in, and how, and how, what I've been learning, just how our world is set up legally, like this tactic, you know, it's kind of like if a police officer pulls you over and he's like, do you, you know, understand what I'm saying? It's like, if you answer yes, then you are putting yourself under his authority. And so right. that's the idea. If you are answering Satan to even answer him in these ways, you are putting yourself under his authority. And that's the whole theme here that that this angel is telling is as though like, dude, Abraham's not even under your authority. Don't even touch him. He's not yours. Right. So, and then of course he's giving Abraham the directions of how not to be, you know, under his authority. So. Yes. And I, you know, I'm glad you brought up that one line there that, um, and with the men whose portion you are, even those who exist on account of your being, and so, you know, without him, they wouldn't even be in existence, which, again, the children of Cain, without a doubt, uh, are derived, and they are of the wicked one. So, all right, continuing, chapter 15. And it came to pass, when the sun was setting, and behold, a smoke like that of a furnace, and the angels who had divided portions of the sacrifice ascended from the top of the furnace of smoke and the angel took me with his right hand and set me on the right wing of the pigeon and he himself sat on the left wing of the turtle dove both of which were as of neither slaughtered nor divided and he carried me up to the edge of the fiery flames and we ascended as if carried by many winds to the heaven that is fixed on the expanses and i saw on the air to whose height we had ascended a strong light which cannot be described and behold in this light a fiery gehenna was enkindled in a great crowd in the likeness of men they all were changing in aspect and shape running and changing form and prostrating themselves and crying words i did not know I always appreciate it. I've learned to appreciate it when they say when different scripture writers were like, it was a strong light that I can't even begin to describe it because every, I used to be like, Oh, come on, man, try to describe it. And every time I read a passage where they try to describe it, I'm like, yeah, I, I got nothing. I can't visualize that. So right, right. it's, it's, it's sometimes I guess just better be like, yeah, I would, I would try to describe this for you, but you're not going to get it anyway. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, you had to be there. All right, yeah. starting from the top, chapter 15. And it came to pass when the sun went down, behold, there was the smoke as of a furnace. And the angels who had the portions of the sacrifice ascended from the top of the smoking furnace. And the angel took me with his right hand and set me upon the right wing of the pigeon and set himself on the left wing of the turtle dove, neither of which birds had been slaughtered. And he bore me to the borders of the flaming fire. And we ascended upon many winds to the heavens, which were above the firmament. And I saw on the air on the heights to which we ascended a strong light impossible to describe and within the light of fi uh, fiercely burning fire of people, many people of male appearance, all constantly changing in aspect and form, running and being transformed and worshiping and crying with the sound of words that I could not recognize. I will quickly point out every time I read this, um, I, I catch something new in here. And it's interesting that these angels are actually going up with the sacrifice to heaven. Uh, that's yes. kind of a, a neat little picture there. Yeah, and with the smoke, yeah. Uh, chapter 16. And I said to the angel, why is it you now brought me here? For now I can no longer see, because I am weakened, and my spirit is departing from me. And he said to me, remain with me, do not fear. He whom you will see coming directly toward us in a great sound of sanctification is the eternal one who has loved you. You will not look at him himself, but let your spirit not weaken, for I am with you, strengthening you. Oh, wow. That was a short chapter. All right. Here we yeah. Go. 
And I said to the angel, why have you now brought me up here? Because my eyes cannot now see distinctly and I am growing weak and my Ruach is departing from me. And he said to me, remain close by me and do not fear for the one whom you cannot see is now coming towards us with a great voice of holiness, even the eternal one who loves you, but you yourself cannot see him. But you must not allow your Ruach to grow faint on account of the choirs of those who cry out, for I am with you to strengthen you. Chapter 17. And while he was still speaking, behold, the fire coming toward us round about, and a voice was in the fire, like a voice of many waters, like a voice of the sea in its uproar. And the angel knelt down with me and worshipped, and I wanted to fall face down on the earth and the place of highness on which we were standing now stopped on high, now rolled down low. And he said only, worship Abraham and recite the song which I taught you. Since there was no ground to which I could fall prostrate, I only bowed down and I recited the song which he had taught me. And he said, recite without ceasing. And I recited, and he himself recited the song. Eternal one, mighty one, holy El, God, autocrat, self-originate, incorruptible, immaculate, unbegotten, spotless, immortal, self-perfected, self-devised, without mother, without father, ungenerated, exalted, fiery, just, lover of men, Benevolent, compassion, bountiful, jealous over me, patient one, most merciful, Eli, eternal, mighty one, holy Sabaoth, most glorious El, 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 I, L, L, you are he my soul has loved, my protector, eternal, fiery, shining, light giving, thunder voice, Lightning visioned, many eyed, receiving the petitions of those who honor you, and turning away from the petitions of those who restrain you by the restraint of their provocations. Redeemer of those who dwell in the midst of the wicked ones, of those who are dispersed among the just of the world, in the, incorru in the corruptible age showing forth the age of the just. You make the light shine before the morning light upon your creation from your face to spend the day on the earth and in your heavenly dwelling place there is an inexhaustible light of an invincible dawning from the light of your face. Accept my prayer and delight in it and accept also the sacrifice you, which you yourself made to yourself through me as I search for you. Receive me favorably, teach me, show me, and make known to your servant what you have promised me. Wow, that was such an amazing uh, chapter. It wasn't a letdown. And right. because I was really feeling it in chapter 16, where he's like, all right, the angel's like, all right, like the most high is coming and, right. you know, um, you can't look at him. He's coming up behind you right now. And I, I was trying to imagine myself in that. I would be like, I would probably like already be on my face. Like, like, oh right. my goodness. Like he's like right behind Don't me look right up, now. Yeah. yeah. And, and I always love how, I mean, that, that song he was to recite was just like through the roof, but, yeah, it's powerful. Uh, but I always love how. Uh, these, you know, I had just said how they they always say like they can't describe what it's like to you know the light and the fire and the all that kind of stuff. Well, I always love how these writers of scripture describe his voice as that of many waters. Yes, because the way I always envision this is that it, it you know it's like his one voice has like hundreds of voices in it. That's how I always yes, imagine yes. it, you know, because it's you can imagine like if you can imagine a hundred voices like overlapping with each other and making one like cohesive thought. That's uh, just uh, that I that sounds awesome and yeah. Mm -hmm. So, all right, back up on the top and uh, let's see. If we, we'll get through this, I think, and that might we'll see how much time we have yeah, left. Yeah, probably be it. 
And while he was thus speaking, fire came all about us, and there was a voice within the fire like the sound of many waters, like the sound of the sea in violent motion. And I desired, to, I mean, wow. <laughs> and I desired to fall down there and worship. And I saw that the angel who was with me bowed his head and worshiped. But the surface of the high place where I seemed to be standing changed its inclination constantly, rolling as the great waves on the surface of the sea. So, I mean, he's got even the even the ground he's on or whatever he's on is like even that's shifting. Like that's right, right. Yeah. Best yeah, to just he said fall there's on, no ground beneath him, yeah. Yeah, best to just fall on your face if you can. And the angel right. said, and the angel said, Worship Abraham and utter the song which I shall now teach you. Which is that's a little bit different translation than yeah. the other one said, the song that I taught you. Right. Uh, but this this actually makes more sense because yeah, actually it does, yeah. Because we haven't seen him teach them the song yet. Right. All right. right. Utter it without ceasing. That is, without pause, in one continuous strain from beginning to end. And the song which he taught me to sing had words appropriate to that sphere in which we then stood. For each sphere in heaven had its own song of praise, and only those who dwell there know how to utter it. And those upon earth cannot know or utter it except they be taught by the messengers of heaven. And the words of the song were of this import, import and signification. And here it is. Eternal, mighty, holy, El, Elohim, only supreme. You who are the self-originated, the, begin, the beginningless one, incorruptible, spotless, uncreated, immaculate, immortal, self-complete, self-illuminating, without father, without mother, unbegotten, exalted, fiery one, lover of men, benevolent one, bountiful one, jealous over me and very compassionate. Eli, my Elohim, eternal, Yehovah, Sabaoth, very glorious, El, 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 Yah, El. You are the one whom my soul has loved, eternal protector, shining like fire, whose voice is like the thunder, whose look is like the lightning. You are the all-seeing one who receives the prayers of all such as honor you. And turn away the request of those who embarrass you with their provo uh, provocations. I don't know why I can't pronounce that. Who dissolves the confusions of the world which arise from the ungodly and the righteous mixed up in the confusion of the corruptible age. And renewing the age of the righteous. Shining, O Adonai, shine as a light, even as the light with which you clothed yourself on the first day of creation. Shine as the light of the morning on your creatures, and let it be day upon earth. For in these heavenly dwelling places there is no need of any other light than the unspeakable splendor from the light of your countenance. O oh, answer my prayer. O oh, be well pleased with it. O oh, accept my sacrifice, which you have prepared for me to offer. Accept me favorably, and show me, teach me, all that you have promised. Awesome. I think we can do one more. Chapter 18. And as I was still reciting the song, the mouth of the fire, which was on the firmament, was rising up on high. And I heard a voice like the roaring of the sea. And it did not cease from the plentitude of the fire. And as the fire rose up, soaring to the highest point, I saw under the fire a throne of fire and the many-eyed ones round about, reciting the song, under the throne four fiery living creatures singing and the appearance of each of them was the same each having four faces and this was the aspect of their faces of a lion of a man of an ox and of an eagle each one had four heads on its body so that the four living creatures had 16 faces and each one had six wings two on the shoulders two halfway down and two at the loins, with the wings which were on their shoulders, they covered their faces. With the wings at their loins, they clothed their feet, and they would stretch the two middle wings out and fly erect. And when they finished singing, they would look at one another and threaten one another. And it came to pass when the angel who was with me saw that they were threatening each other, he left me and went running to them. 
and he turned the face of each living creature from the face which was opposite it, so that they could not see each other's faces threatening each other. And he taught them the song of peace, which the Eternal One has in himself. And while I was still standing and watching, I saw behind the living creatures a chariot with fiery wheels. Each wheel was full of eyes round about. And above the wheels was the throne which I had seen. And it was covered with fire, and the fire encircled it round about. And an indescribable light surrounded the fiery crowd. And I heard the voice of their sanctification, like the voice of a single man. Well, I'll say this uh, in case I get cut off uh, at the end of the show. Uh, obviously, we're seeing the the four creatures from Ezekiel here. I, I yes, assume Ezekiel exactly. chapter one, right. and also Revelation chapter four. I think it is. And this has to be the most curious. Uh, they they match Ezekiel very well with the four faces each, but this has to be the most curious um, description of them that I have ever seen. I never, yeah. I never once imagined reading them in Ezekiel and Revelation that they would not get along, and that right. they would threatening each other. <laughs> I mean, just the more I, I learn about like Yah, the, you know, the most high, like he really is really not tame in so many ways. Like he just, it's wild, you know? Um, it, it seems, yeah, it sounds like a very exciting place to be. Okay, I'll, I'll start reading. All right. Unless if you want to say something. And and while I yeah. was still, and while I was still reciting the song, the mouth of the fire, which was on the surface, rose up on high. And I heard a voice like the roaring of the sea nor did it cease on account of the rich abundance of the fire. And as the fire raised itself up, ascending into the heights, I saw under the fire a throne of fire and round about it in the watchfulness of many eyes, even the all-seeing ones re reciting their song. And under the throne, four fiery living ones sing. All right, brother, we'll pick it up with you on the next part and the next show. Right. Thanks for having me on. Hey, thanks for joining us. God bless all. Good night and thank you for being with us. Thank you everybody for joining us for this video and this broadcast. We appreciate all of you and thank you for your patronage. Please do like and subscribe and share with your friends. God bless all of you and your seeking.